Welcome to the Africa Podcast. My name is Mikey Mhenna. We are recording this special episode on Tuesday, November 14th at 6.45 in uh, Palestine time. Today, our special guest is Dima Khatib, who is a journalist by training. She's the managing director of AJ+, Plus, um, all the different AJ+, Plus channels, and is somebody who I admire tremendously. Dima, thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Hi, Mikey, and hi, everybody. Thank you for having me at this very special time. Yeah. Um, so full disclosure, we had, uh, for the audience, we had spoken months back saying, what well, I really want to have this conversation about, you know, you and your broader career and work and perspective and all the many things that you've done over the course of your career. And at some point we're going to have that conversation, but it's almost impossible not to talk about AJ Plus's work right now, which is, I think, some of the most important work being done, especially in the media landscape and um, to combat misinformation, disinformation, dehumanizing narratives about Palestinians. Um, and you are in the thick of it. And so maybe the first question is, how are you? Like, how are you, how are you surviving this? That's a tough question. I, I don't know how we are. Uh, just as you're speaking, I'm looking at the pictures of a, a, a child that they're trying to get from under a wall seems to have fallen on top of her on Al Jazeera's live feed. This is, this is their life 24 seven and our life is just watching that almost helplessly knowing this is going to happen again tomorrow uh, is it, it, just unbearable. It's unbearable to watch this day in, day out. And this is humans doing it to other humans. And we are all saying no to this, like all as in millions every day. Yeah. And yet, keeps happening the next day. It reminds me of the war on Iraq. I felt the same way. Yeah, it's it's like, you know, I was it's so funny that you said that because I was telling friends in the States that I'm having 2003 flashbacks of feeling stuck on this moving sidewalk that seems like is forcing us over the cliff and and being surrounded by people asking and begging and pleading, no, like what, what, what is happening? Why? Um, and, and, and the lies, you remember, uh, Colin Powell telling us about the chemical weapons in Iraq. And I see the press conference every day by the Israeli occupation army. And the guy is giving us all this incredible evidence, incredibly like unconvincing evidence of uh, all the stuff that they're trying to convince the world of, that it is legitimate to bomb hospitals, ambulances, bakeries, supermarkets, schools, houses, day in, day out. And it, it just feels the same lies over and over again, the same that happened in Iraq. The whole world is on the street telling you, stop. And and you even want to send Tony Blair, you know, you want to put Tony Blair in it. That's what they said yesterday, I think, or the day before that. Yeah, be I some that. humanitarian what? I mean, war criminals asking other war criminals who have more experience with wars to help them assist the population. I mean, I, I, I just, it's just so much wrong in it. So many layers of wrong thing. Yeah. It's, um, you know, there's all this targeting of, uh, of journalists and journalism and truth, right? Quite literal, literal targeting journalists being, um, targeted by shelling, by, uh, by bombing, um, over the course of your career, have you ever seen anything at this level? No. And, uh, it's not just me. Everybody's saying this is the most intense loss of journalists' life 
um, in such a short span of time. It is the first time in my career I've been a journalist since 1993. I've never seen anything like this. And NGOs are confirming this is the biggest loss of journalists in such a short span of time. We've lost uh, more than one journalist per day, as in like lost their life. Um, and the truth is being assassinated every day. And and what what hurts me is that journalists around the world are playing the game. So the Israeli um, the Israeli occupation army releases some video, and it's very obvious to all of us that not only it's fake, it's falsified. It has actors in it. I don't know if you saw the days of the week being, you know, yesterday. Yeah. And, you know, Western media just takes that and, and puts it on air. No verification. While we have to prove to the world that we're dead. Mr. Biden came out to ask, wonder whether we're actually dead or not. Palestinians have to prove that they're dead after they're killed. And the Israeli propaganda gets taken over by Western media and repeated and discussed. There's a nurse, a fake nurse, who pretended she was she needed to be saved from a hospital. I mean, yeah. any Palestinian would figure out in two seconds that she's not Palestinian, and she's like, she's got these, um, you know, gloves. They we analyze the sound, and it has like, you know, the bombing sound repeated in the background. You know, it's all yeah. edited, and Western media takes that and plays it over and over and over again. And that's what I'm saying. The truth is being assassinated. The whole idea of the journalist community sitting in a studio, not challenging people who are saying, we want to kill all Palestinians in Gaza. They all deserve to be killed. There are no innocent, innocent civilians in Gaza. Unchallenged. People yeah. are calling for genocide in France, in UK. I mean, I've seen it a lot in France. But I've seen it in lots of other places too, unchallenged. Where yeah. are the journalists who are supposed to hold people accountable for what they say? Where is the fight against hate, hate, hate speech? Does that only apply when it's targeting specific people? That's that's the that's what we just discussed before this conversation that. I am rethinking everything. I think that maybe this is the end of the westernization of us, the globalization of the world, because it's all falling apart. It's all falling apart. It seems the values and the human rights and the democracy and the liberties and the fraternity and the equality and everything that we have all said, yes, we want, doesn't apply to us. Yeah. Yeah, and in in so many ways, it feels like if it feels like the um, so many of the institutions built in the middle of the twentieth century um, are completely disintegrating because the intellectual the intellectual properties that uh, the intellectual intellectual um, pillars on which they are built are completely being ignored. Um, I'll ask you to try to answer a question that it's impossible for you to answer, but I'll just ask you anyway. Um, when you're rhetorically saying, where are the journalists? Where are they? Like, if you were to actually ask and try to answer that question, are there structural reasons why they are not analyzing the sound? Or are there individual choices? There's a, there's a quote from that um, that great HBO show, um, Boardwalk Empire, where one guy says to another, "You're either you're either dumb or you're lying, and neither are acceptable." I agree. But remember, the war in Iraq it was the same. Mm -hmm. So we've seen this movie before. Afghanistan. Yeah. They would repeat Wesley Clark's press conferences from Brussels, they would believe him saying that, that the terrorists had been bombed while we showed the pictures of women and children, bodies and bodies of them scattered 
where the bomb had fallen. And they would yeah. continue repeating that a terrorist camp had been bombed by NATO. So this is not new, but it is taking a completely different scale today because we are talking about genocide. And it's there is intent of genocide publicly, even uh, proudly. Yeah. Pro- rather than shared with the world. Yeah. Now they are even using, I don't know if you saw that, they're using the word Nakba in in Hebrew, the Arabic word Nakba. For 70 something years, we've been fighting for the recognition of the Nakba as an event that has happened. And I have been censored so many times because I was told, no, no, you cannot use the word Nakba. That d- does not exist. The 15th of May, 1948 was the day Israel was founded. That's the their independence day or independence, whatever. That's not yeah. Nakba. And the word Nakba has always been like this taboo that we're trying to impose everywhere. And now they use it. So they're acknowledging there was ethnic cleansing, that there was a people there. There were Palestinians there, that they did ethnic cleansing, which is the first Nakba. And that now they're doing the Nakba Gaza. They said that in Hebrew. The Minister of Agriculture said that two days ago. And so this intent is very clear, supported by powers around the world, colonial powers, imperialist powers, surprise, right? Um, And I'm wondering, the journalists, you asked the question, where are they? Maybe, and this is just a question I'm asking myself, maybe there is a systemic inherent racism, supremacy, that people are not even aware of. And maybe they don't even realize they're practicing that. I I wonder, I really wonder how a journalist can sit and not challenge words about genocide. A, a yeah. European, you know, like fraternité, égalité, liberté, France, you know, I, I am shocked. I think France is one of the biggest shocks of, for me in this period because maybe I, I studied human rights in France. Like, isn't that the place where you would study human rights? Yeah. I studied in the in the Strasbourg Institute for Human Rights. I studied all about international law in Switzerland, you know? Like, I, I, I learned about my rights as a Palestinian there. And now I'm looking at them like when it comes to us, it doesn't work, it doesn't apply. So I think we're talking here about two parallel worlds. We don't live in the same world where the lives of Palestinians are kind of like, you know, if you take a scale, like they're, they, you know, 1,000 Palestinians, that's worth one. Exactly. It's, it's a 1,000 to one uh, Like 1,000 to one. And, and like, yeah, I mean, they, they just, it's their fault. They have too many kids. That's why the kids are dying. I've heard this. Yeah. I've heard this. So... It is a time where we need to question these things. I don't have answers. I'm very disappointed with the journalists, but I'm also hopeful because I see that Palestine, the word Palestine, the flag of Palestine is everywhere. Like we've never seen it before. The slogan, free, free Palestine from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. It's literally everywhere. It's an avalanche. Artists are, you know, Rappers, rock stars, everywhere you see people are rising from anywhere. I've seen Norway, I don't know, places, artists, I don't know. They're just like going, oh, free Palestine. And that tells you, you know, we're going through an earthquake, tectonic, you know, plates are moving and something's got to give. Something will give. And we've seen like people are upset in the BBC. People are upset in the State Department. They are for voicing, you know, that they're upset. Something to give. I think this will be, this is not just about Palestine. This is about the whole structure 
of our world today. And Palestine has always been for me, a, a, you know, a compass. It, it has always been my moral compass. And I think today more than ever, it's becoming the moral compass for the whole world. It's a big test. Yeah. You know, I have a question for you. Because you were talking about the 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 um, newsrooms and the the people in the State Department, there was a story about all these congressional aides, U.S. congressional aides, who are signing letters saying, um, "We don't, you know, we don't, we don't agree with our Congress people and our senators." Um, and it reminded me of this article. And since you are, you know. Um, at the helm of one of the most important media organizations covering this issue. Um, there was an article I read in none other than Teen Vogue, okay? A, a couple weeks ago. And it was recounting all the different US celebrities and where they stood. Hmm. And it, it, was like, it was like published like October 14th or October 15th. Hmm. Um, and in the article it said, so and so, and like uh, Justin Bieber and whoever, like maybe three or four names, signed this letter among many other celebrities, uh, demanding that uh, you know uh, President Joe Biden supports Israel and they're getting back the volunteers and has unwavering support for Israel. Comma, however, the letter did not mention the twenty-year-long siege of uh, Gaza, nor did it mention the seventy-five-year-long occupation of. Palestinian territories. Um, and I thought I was blown away by that sentence because, because Teen Vogue knows who their audience is. Mm. Very clearly, they know who their audience is. And that is a sentence that would never have been included in an article like that 20 years ago. That, there is no way. That's yeah. a Gen Z effect on social media. Yeah. Have you been on TikTok recently? Yeah. I am learning. I am learning new ways of conveying very deep messages through amazing ways that the Gen Zs use on TikTok. It's incredible how they are supporting Palestine. Gen Zs from all over the world, you know? Yeah. I don't know if you see those people who do the lives, the conversation yeah. between uh, Palest pro-Palestinian and Israeli. It is, a, it's all Gen Z. They're like yeah. 18, 19, 20. These conversations speak volumes. Like they tell you more than articles. They tell you more than books in just one minute. Yeah. So I'm wondering. Yeah, I think this is a shift. This is. The, it's a huge shift. It's a huge shift. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Do you, have you noticed um, any different trends in the engagement with AJ plus material um, over the last month. Ha of have course. there, have you seen that no. shift as well? Yes. Absolutely. What is the shift? First of all, we have been growing. Uh, some of our accounts, I think our Instagram account on in Arabic. Look, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but yeah. up to 7,000% growth that we've had over the last, uh, and then in the first month since 7th, uh, 7th of October. We have grown dramatically in all four languages. Our engagement is absolutely crazy. Our shares, we have tens of millions of views on some of the videos on Instagram. Some of our videos we publish on YouTube and within like 24 hours, we have millions of views on it. Yeah. Um, engagement is crazy in all four languages. And I'll tell you something, engagement is crazy also and again, I, I want to talk about France because I, I follow it very closely. On the videos that are, the videos I told you about, where somebody is unchallenged, live, yeah. show, and talks about killing all Palestinians, you should see the engagement. Yeah. People are doing the challenging that the journalists are not doing. And it is beautiful to watch. Yeah. It is it is empowering to watch. As much as I'm disappointed with the journalism, I am so hopeful that people will not let it pass. And you saw what happened in the UK. The one million march toppled the Minister of Interior. 
it does have an effect. Everything we do, our our little grain of, you know, it does have an effect. Everything yeah. we do has an effect. It's a ripple effect. It's accumulated. It is the butterfly effect. Everything we do. Look, I want to show you something. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen this. My son explained to me why it's W, AG plus real news. It says watch AG plus for real news. Do you know why it's W and the rest are kind of almost invisible? No. You're more. not a Gen Z, Mikey. My son explained it to me. He said, when you put something W, it's win. Win yeah. AJ plus real news. Because that's how Gen Z expresses. I thought maybe they didn't have enough ink to write the letters. Watch AJ plus real news. No, yeah. this is a Gen Z message. This was in DC in the March. Nice. I know. This, yeah. this for me is my award. You know, this is it. People yeah. know. People are very savvy. They know. They know what's happening and they're fighting it. So that's why I'm saying this is such an incredible time. Palestine, these kids from Gaza, they're making the world change. I just hope we're going to be in a better place. It will take a while, but I, I, I hope it, we will be in a better place. The whole system needs to be toppled. I want to ask you about the whole system needing to be toppled. Um, I was having like a, a conversation <laughs> with myself a couple of days ago, going for a walk. My brain was like going to break um, at work. And I was thinking about this idea of like, we need our own platforms. We cannot, yeah. we can't, we, we can't um, rely on other platforms anymore. Okay. Um, and you, you work and manage one of those platforms, right? You've, you guys are building your own platform and maybe, a, and, and are, have been doing it for decades, right? How do you, what does that look like longer term? When, when you say platform, what exactly yeah. do you mean? Because for me, platform is Instagram, TikTok is a platform because they oh, yeah, yeah. face. We are not a platform in my oh, no, no. What, what I mean by that is, um, I, what I mean by that is institutions, right? right? So right. Uh, of that, that includes social media platforms. We do but it all need to build our own platforms. That's why I'm asking you what you mean by platforms, because right now platforms are trying to censor content yeah. and, and control the narrative. They do yeah. shadow banning. They, you know, they do a lot of things, they remove videos, yeah. you know, they do a lot of things. And, and I have to say, this also has been zigzagging up and down. Like it gets worse and it gets better. But yeah, let me answer my question first about the platforms. Yeah. That's part of the, the change. That's, I think that should be the outcome of this transitional period we're going through. That we cannot be controlled by platforms that are controlled by money that is linked to the same system that is oppressing all of us, which is the same colonial imperialist system that is killing Palestinians. Because otherwise we will always be subjected to this kind of erasure. Yeah. Apartheid in Palestine, practiced by Israel, has extended to the whole world on Palestine. Look at us. The world is practicing apartheid against Palestinians, even on platforms. I call that apartheid. Because when the content is produced by one side with a certain narrative, it is welcome, goes very far. When the content is the other counter narrative, which is the Palestinian, it is censored. It is exactly what's happening in Palestine. They are going after Israeli citizens who are Palestinians, who live in 1948, arresting them because they like the post. Yeah. Watching, watching Abu Ubaidah's speeches is, all, is a crime now. Is a crime in Israel, according to the new legislation, right? So we need our own platforms, and that's a big battle. Look, there was Baz. I don't know if you've been on Baz. It's an attempt for an Arab platform that is controlled by 
our capital and our roles hasn't really flown, you know, but I do think this is a conversation we need to have. Look yeah. at Web Summit. Did you see what happened at Web Summit? Yeah, I used to go to Web Summit every, every year. I was a keynote speaker every year. Well, yeah. Paddy had to leave because Paddy, who, who's a, a, an Irish, of course, Ireland is a place where you will never find anybody who doesn't support Palestine. Yeah. Paddy said that Israel is committing war crimes, which is the truth. Well, he had to resign and now it's been taken over by the other side. So, you know, yeah. our platforms are being reduced. Now, back to your question. How important was it to have started AJ Plus? Oh my God, what would we do without AJ Plus today? I'm, I mean, I'm so proud. This is such a proud moment in the career of a journalist to be able to make a difference with the work you do. That your values, your mission in life goes hand in hand with the values and mission of the place where you work and hand in hand with the values and mission and needs of the people, of the people that need you who are the voiceless, the ones that are being erased, the ones that are being silenced. Look what they're doing in North Gaza. They're trying to silence everybody so they can kill them silently because they want to kill Palestinians and they want them to be silent about it. So it was very important to have set up AJ Plus eight years ago, especially that AJ Plus is set up in a way that speaks to the audiences of each language respectively from the perspective of those audiences and not from our Arab or Muslim or Middle Eastern or call it whatever you want perspective. So. Yeah. It sees you and then it tells you the stories that matter to you from your perspective. And that's why we're able to talk to the French speaking audiences, the Spanish speaking audiences, the English speaking audiences differently to the Arab audiences that we have in Israel. Yeah. Can I ask you a question about, um, about the, your journalists in, um, in Gaza? Um, yeah. Or journalists more broadly in Gaza, you you were just saying like you're watching the live feed. Yeah. Are those feeds ever interrupted? Yeah. yeah. Like I'm not, I don't know the technic yeah, technicalities, but can you walk me through like how we can protect them? How, oh, they are. You know, they they are interrupted, and and we have uh, we have had moments of like saying, oh my god, we lost the feed in northern Gaza. Um. And I think that's what uh, what they want. Th that's what they did in Baghdad, 8th of April, 2003. They bombed all the journalists. So the next day, they could claim that they have, they are, they're in Baghdad, statue down, la la li la la la, and we never found out what happened in between. That's what they do. That's typical textbook, 101 war tactics. So... Yes, the feed um, has been interrupted. Our journalists uh, have to leave in northern Gaza, although we still have people who are uh, sending us stories uh, however they can. We're calling them by phone. We're getting testimonies from inside of Shifa Hospital. This is my mission now, is to keep the stories coming from northern Gaza. There are 800,000 people who are still there. Israel is trying to tell us all the Palestinians left. We've heard that before, right? We all yeah. left. Yeah. Um, they haven't. 800,000 people are still there. And their stories need to be told. And this is the challenge today. Western media is going to get the story from Northern Gaza through the embedded journalists. This invention made by the U.S. during the war on Iraq. That this is proper journalism that you go with an army that controls whatever you say, checks your pictures and tells you what to do. You're doing direct free propaganda. You're paying money. You're paying your journalists, your camera, your work to give somebody propaganda where they're actually invading somebody else's country. And this will be the source of news for the whole world. Basically, that's what they want. We're trying to keep the voices alive the human stories of the, of the Palestinians trapped in Gaza. And that's not an easy job. 
But this is our mission today. We have segments every day, voices from Gaza. Ahl Gaza in Arabic. Yeah. Voices de Gaza in Espanol. Les Voix de Gaza in French. Where this is our mission today. And I, I do believe that we are the only ones, Al Jazeera is the only one that is providing a very comprehensive, representative, representative coverage across Palestine and of Palestinians around the world and anything Palestine around the world. I don't think anybody else is doing it. And I'm very grateful to be part of Al Jazeera in this very important moment in time. And I know that we are under pressure. Yeah. But, you know, we don't budge. I mean, you heard some of the statements probably about us in in Israel, in the U.S. But, you know, we've done this before, so we know. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know if you've ever been shadow banned as a platform? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we get shadow. Our videos sometimes disappear, they come back. This is our daily life. This is our daily bread and butter. It's part of the resistance. And you know, I mean, I, I'm trying not to think about people. We lost Shirin. Yeah. It was very tough last year. And looking at our journalists today losing their families, they were targeted yesterday in south of Lebanon. Yep. Um, targeted. Clearly targeted. Uh, and if they're there risking their life, losing their family, we're supposed to be like dedicating every centimeter of, of power we have, every voice we have, every minute of our life, trying to convey the message and tell the story of those people. No foreign journalist can go into Gaza. Let me remind the world of that. When the I don't think Western, people know that. When Western media goes and says, oh, these numbers are given by Hamas because nobody else is allowed in to count the dead. You don't allow the UN. You don't allow the journalists. You don't allow parliamentarians from around the world. You don't allow anybody to go in. And then you blame the Palestinians for counting their own dead. It's it's unbelievable how like people seem to have forgotten that Gaza has been under siege for 17 years, that before that it was occupied, that Palestinians have been evicted and kicked out and dispossessed and forcibly removed from their homes and displaced and orphaned over and over and over again. And people just seem to blame the Palestinians because they count their dead, blame the Palestinians because they defend themselves. We have the right to defend ourselves. We are occupied. It is legal, not just legitimate, not just moral legitimate. It's legal for an occupied people to defend themselves against the occupying power that is occupying them. And everybody's talking about Israel's self-defense. I'm like, guys, yeah. read international law, you know, like listen to Albanese, you know, Francesca Albanese, she's been trying to tell the world about it. Red Cross has said that for days, Israel hasn't been willing to collaborate with them to go get any injured, any people from the Al-Shifa hospital out. You know what they want to do? They want to come out with like some PR stunt, like, oh, no, we're saving the baby. Yeah. That's what they want to do. So you, do you know the, the, the saying in Arabic, you kill them and then you walk in their funeral? Mm. You know, basically that's what they do. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about um, the sort of information wars. Um, I, I I did this poll on, uh, on Instagram, uh, seeing if people think they have convinced many people through their posting and their social media activity, some people probably not any or definitely no one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I got a, a different spattering of results. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about the impact of AJ plus at scale with tens of millions of views. Mm. How do you think about that as managing director and 
moving the needle and truth with a capital T, getting people to know the truth. How do you think about um, your audience and trying to move them towards truth and information? Mm. I was trying. I was trying to show the the map. I can. Right? I can see it. I, I can see it can perfectly. You see it? Yes, from the river to the sea. Right. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, good question. I do think AJ Plus audiences are very well informed. The challenge for us is to reach out to those other audiences that are not. Yeah. That's a constant challenge. Obviously, it's always a challenge. And and when I told you we've grown up to seven thousand percent on some of our accounts, um, that's the kind of thing that I'm thinking. Great, that's amazing because then we're reaching out to new countries. For example, our uh, friend, Alipus Jose, we've reached mm -hmm. new African as French speaking country through our coverage. Yeah. And that's incredible because, you know, the global South matters and the global South needs to hear the story from the global South and not through the colonial North, not through Reuters, AFP, uh, AP, because those have the narrative of the colonial powers and they tell us about each other through their lens. So they tell us that Mexicans are all drug dealers and Arabs are all terrorists, right? Hollywood yeah. kind of style, right? So... What this connection, global south to global south, is extremely important because I was also shocked. I went to Kenya on vacation this year and people didn't know much about Palestine. I was very disappointed. And I realized it's up to us to do that, right? Who's going to do it for us if we don't do it? Yeah. I thought, oh, Africa is with us. No, I'm sorry. That's not true because they are informed through all of these other narratives, right? Yeah. So back to the audience. How much do we achieve? Look, there is, I, I know that haters come. I see them. So that's a good sign, right? Because they're, they're upset. And that means they're seeing our content where they were yeah. not expecting to see it, maybe within their friends or, you know? Yeah. So I, I do think we have an impact, but I also think we can do much more to reach out to those who um, may not be interested automatically. How do you reach those? You know, we want to reach everybody. I'll tell you a little anecdote about a documentary that Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera investigative unit did. Um, it was about the lobby in the UK and in the US, the Zionist lobby. And uh, there's an interview with, uh, I can't remember now who is the person, but it's somebody who works for the lobby in the US. And they said something about AJ+. Plus. This is years ago. They said, AJ+, Plus is such a trap because you look at it and you think, oh my God, it's so liberal, it's so cool. Until you watch a video about Palestine and you are like, what? How can you be liberal and not pro-Israel? These guys are crazy. And that's the thing, that we are liberal and cool. And people think liberal and cool, you have to be pro-Israel in the U.S. But we are liberal and cool and pro-Palestine, pro-Indigenous rights, pro-Black Lives Matter, pro-everything that, yeah. you know, corresponds to a, a social justice fight. So, yeah, when I hear that, I think, okay, we're doing something. We can do much more for sure. Yeah. You know, I wanted, we were talking about pl platforms and you mentioned TikTok. Yeah. TikTok is not an American platform. It's a Chinese platform. It says the guy is from Singapore. The, the guy is from Singapore, but it's a Chinese, it's a Chinese yeah. company. Yeah. Um, and... I'm curious if you've noticed different different results in the algorithm on TikTok than you have on um, on Instagram, because those algorithms are written by people from different places with different um, mm. uh, parameters that they're optimizing for. TikTok and is TikTok is very tough, tough Mikey. Tell me my tell me more. TikTok is trying to survive in the U.S. market. Because mm. it's market. 
TikTok is making a lot of money, a lot, a lot of money. And it wants yeah. to maintain its success in the U.S. market. So TikTok is kind of like navigating. It's a little bit like China. You don't know if it's capitalist, communist, what is it, right? It's navigating. It's, it's, it's making a lot of money, but it's yeah. not really doing any good for humanity, you know? Where in is the words of today? Where yeah. is the multipolar world they kept telling us about for like 20 years now? I haven't heard anything. Oh, China has said a couple of words about Palestine since the 7th of October. Nothing significant, really. So I think people might think, oh, TikTok, because it's Chinese, it's much more liberal uh, in terms of like censorship on Palestine than Instagram. I'm sorry to disappoint you. It's not. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the most, um, if, if uh, Facebook, X or Twitter, um, Instagram and TikTok um, or Snapchat. I don't know if you guys uh, post on Snapchat, but we're all different places. Which place do you think is most um, receptive to pro-Palestinian messages? Hey. Interesting. How since, come? Since the overtake by Elon Musk, I think X is allowing, I mean, I don't see my tweet being shadow banned, censored, um, Instagram is a daily, daily, daily struggle. Look at people. How many times do you see people posting, oh, I'm on the beach. I'm trying to break the algorithm. Do you see? Yeah, that? I do it. Right. I do it right. once a day. I, I do, never, I never do this on, on, on X, Twitter, whatever it's called. Um, and I have yeah. to say, I'm someone who abandoned Twitter. I almost deactivated, I'm deactivated my account, came back couple of times and I wanted to delete it. Although I was one of, you know, I was very, very active on Twitter a long time ago. But today I have to say Twitter has been, I mean, X is, is the best out of all of them. YouTube is good, but you have to know the ins and outs of it. Like mm -hmm. some of the pictures you may use will put the, well, the algorithm will just like put you in the basement uh, yeah. like that. So. YouTube has been good, I have to say. X and YouTube, um, not Facebook, not Instagram. We're not on Snapchat uh, and not TikTok. We, we, I do think that, as I said, they zigzag, you know? Yeah. They censored a lot in the beginning and then they kind of like gave in, I think. And then they, yeah. you know. If I were having this conversation with you in um, on October sixth, mm. we'd be talking about travel, women, yeah. women empowerment, motherhood, yeah. a life well, work balance, yeah, uh, female leadership. I don't know, lot. So, I can think about a gazillion things I would have told you about poetry, yeah. languages, Latin America. We'll have all those conversations, but here's my, here's my question. Yeah. If I were to ha have this conversation, if I were having this conversation with you on October 6th, um, and I asked you, do you think that the world, um, cares about Palestine? On October 6th? Yeah. What would you have said? No. And now if, if, they, so? if they cared about Palestine, I wouldn't be a refugee. My father would not have died outside his country, unable to be buried in his country. I would be in Palestine if the world cared about Palestine. I would be allowed to go in. I, I can't go to Palestine. I can't go in. Like so many millions of us, Palestinian refugees, born refugees. We're the only people in the world who are born refugees. You become a refugee usually after you're born. No, we're born refugees, generation after generation. So, no, the world didn't care about Palestine for 75 years. And and what is the world? Yeah, that's what I want right? to get to. What is the world? Well, as I told you, I believe there are two different worlds now. I, I see two, it's like in a 9-11 moment. There are two different worlds. There's the world that's on the streets of London. And there's the word who goes and like says to Israel, kill as many Palestinians as you want. 
these two worlds exist, coexist. So yeah. if you ask me now, does the world care about Palestine? I think people care about Palestine. Do you believe that more today than you did on October 6th? Absolutely. And mm. that's the thing that keeps me going that like, I see the outpouring of love and it just, I, I, I was in grief, um, after the 7th of October and I just happened to walk by and, and see, uh, people with flag. Uh, first of all, I, I was walking downtown Athens first day. Okay. And people yeah. were like, free Palestine. Did you see this? You know? Yeah. Or like, they just smile at me. They're like, you know, and that's amazing. And then I joined this march, just this rally by chance, right? And I thought, oh, maybe some Arabs are doing this. It was all Greek people. It was thousands, I think maybe tens of thousands of Greek. I was trying to find if there's any Arabs around. And I talked to them. They were all unions, you know, people who yeah. knew so much about Palestine. They... I had amazing conversations. They knew about apartheid. They knew about the occupation. They knew about 48, about 67. They knew about us refugees. They were all Greek. Yeah. And I was there for two weeks, four different rallies. And what, what did they do? They went to both the Israeli and the American embassy. Yeah. So the outpouring of love that I see and kind of like, oh, the masks are down. No more, no more telling us you care about human rights. We're not going to believe you anymore. We know you. And I think, and I, I, I like how Europe in some way, and maybe the U.S., is trying to defend itself. Because, you know, if you are censored on Palestine today, you'll be censored on anything else tomorrow. If you accept it today, you are going to mm. be priced from your well-deserved freedom, you know? Your well-deserved democracy. And if your democracy doesn't work today, as in your leaders don't listen to you when you're one million on the streets of London, then you don't have a democracy. Yeah. It's, um, it cuts both ways. Yeah, so people are defending Palestine, but they're actually defending what they deserve to have as well for themselves. They're defending democracy. They're defending freedom. They're defending human rights. They're de defending humanity. So those people who say, no, 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 I am for the freedom of Palestinians. I am for peace. Peace will only be achieved through the freedom of everybody. Everybody's freedom. Otherwise, no peace. Can I have some chocolate? Sahtin. Resistance. Um, yeah, right. There's some things you shouldn't resist. That's one of them. Resistance, not, uh, not towards chocolate. Um, do you know the history of Emmett Till? Do you know, uh, that name? Uh, yeah. Emmett, Emmett Till was this, uh, young black boy, um, in the early, I think the early twenties, um, if I get that right, who was, who was murdered by Klansmen in Mississippi or in, somewhere in the South. And he was completely mutilated, um, very young boy. And um, his, his mother decided to bury him with an open casket. Um, and it was this huge court case um, because he was wrongfully accused. Long story short, um, he, uh, his mother very intentionally uh, had the funeral with an open casket so that the newspapers who took it Took, took pictures of Emmett Till could see how terribly mutilated he was and murder and how he was murdered. And those photos became instantly iconic because of the horror. And there were many, many civil rights uh, activists, including Martin Luther King, who described themselves as being part of the Emmett Till generation mm. because they were part of that mo moment and they decided to convert it into a movement and said, I can't, I can't sit by. Um, from your vantage point, you guys are publishing so many, not only you, but you and Jazeera more broadly, but so many amazing young activists on the ground, 
who are posting on Instagram and posting mm -hmm. on TikTok and incredible uh, work are creating those moments. Yeah. How do you bear the responsibility? How does that responsibility feel? Well, I mean, we're, we were trying to create or recreate those sentences that we heard the kid say in Gaza, like, shukran ya ashab, thank you, ambulance, you know? Or that kid, I don't know if you saw it, she was like, um, are you going to take me to the cemetery now? I saw it. Heartbreaking. Or the the woman, the, the, the girl who said, I recognize my mother from her hair. We're trying to do some artwork around them to eternalize them, you know, to keep them in people's memory. Um, because it's all about humanizing the story. We're not numbers. Palestinians are not numbers. If you remember the the Syrian boy Ilan, do you remember on the beach? Yeah, of course. This like his picture, that moment moved the whole world. We'll never forget him, right? Ilan. And I, I think it is it is that's why I was telling you it's our responsibility, our mission now is to keep the story alive because there's already fatigue, by the way. People move on. Uh, and we have to make sure the story keeps going. People are still dying every day. But people got used to those people dying every day. Just like Ukraine, just like Iraq, just like Afghanistan, just like the Rohingya, just like Rwanda at that time, which was my first story ever, you know? I mean, Darfur. Uh, yeah. Darfur or the Syria, you know? the Arab revolutions, everything is just normalized. So it is very important for us to keep those moments alive in people's memories and in people's consciousness. It is important that people still continue to feel the responsibility of not accepting this. This is not acceptable. This should not have happened. Should, should not be happening as we speak. Should not happen again tomorrow. And the only way we can do that if if the people manage to hold the leaders accountable. There is total impunity. The war criminals who did the war in Iraq, on Afghanistan, again now, even the war criminals in our region who, who committed war crimes against their own people, using their army to bomb their own people, yeah. they're still there. And, and that's because... I think now I, I, I think now I, I can say it. I think I know it. And it's not a conspiracy theory. It is the truth. This is how we are controlled in this part of the world. This yeah. is how we're controlled. We're controlled through a system that is based on leaders who are, first of all, do you know what's the meaning of piti yankee in Spanish? No. The small Yankee, it's a small gringo, it's a small American. That's the slave of the Americans, the slave of the gringos. Mm. That's a, a, an expression used in Latin American political jargon to talk about all these leaders that yeah, do whatever, whatever the United puppets. States. Yeah, the nice. puppets. Thank you. So all these pity Yankees, right, who, uh, who just want to stay where they are, like Netanyahu. He's doing all of this to stay where he is because he knows when this is over, he's going down the drain. And yeah. to stay, they have to please the masters. And basically, this is it. That's why Egyptians were not supported when they wanted freedom. Syrians were completely erased when they asked to, to get their freedom. Etc. Etc. All of them. The Sudanese. Yeah. So. So we need accountability. Impunity is unacceptable. Deb, um, let me ask you one last question before we wrap up. 
Have we been and... talking for a while? No. Oh. But um, we're running up against the hour soon. But I have a question for you. Okay. Um, imagine you're speaking to a class filled with high schoolers who are like, listen, we, we want to watch TikTok. We want to watch YouTube clips. We want to watch Instagram, but we also want to, uh, do a little more in depth reading and thinking about what's happening. What would be your recommendation? that they go read, whether it's about today's moment, whether it's about mm. um, the broader context, what would you suggest? First of all, um, if they want to watch videos, we've made amazing context videos on AJ Plus about the story of Palestine, Israel, colonization, everything. You will find all kinds of videos on our YouTube channel. But if you are a reader, you like to read books, oh my God, there are so many books to read. Listen, um, I I was raised I was raised in Syria under Hafez al Assad's regime, right? So my view of the world and of Palestine was was a dogmatic, uh, you know, very much propaganda based view, of course. Yeah. And it's very interesting that my awareness of the identity of a Palestinian, what it means to be Palestinian only became clear to me or clearer once I read books written by Jews. So reading, of course, Ilan Pape, Shlomo San, although I do have some, you know, parts of the book um, about the invention of the I think it's called, the, I read it in French, so I'm not sure what it's called in, in English. Invention of the Jewish people, I think it's called. Yeah. Um, then you have uh, Norman Finkelstein, incredible. Mm -hmm. They're all Jewish and even Israeli, right? Um, of course, Noam Chomsky. Um, I read articles, and at the time it was not very common to do that. I read articles by Amira Haas very early on. She's an Israeli. And Gideon Levy, who's an incredible yeah. speaker on Palestine, Israel. And I am not, I am, I don't engage with Israeli. I'm one not to engage because I consider that any Israeli who accepts to be part of the system, he is still, or she is still, or they are still in Israel as a citizen. They are, as long as they're not giving me half their house, to go back to, then why am I going to engage with them? This whole peace talk without giving us access to our country where we can share, you know, peacefully, both free, right? I don't have anything to engage on, but I read all these books and I advise everybody to read all those books if they can. Or to listen to a uh, um, Norman Filkenstein talking today, yeah. reflecting on the moral struggle he had with the seventh of October. Incredible, Ilan Pape saying that, and he says it today. He says Hamas is a national liberation movement, and he's an Israeli Jew. Mm. Um, but I have to say that on top of the books. What helped me understand Palestine is Latin America. And I remember when I went to Mexico, and I don't know if you've been to Mexico, there's huge Socalo, which is like the central square, mm -hmm. downtown Mexico City. And then you see this cathedral, and they tell you it's built over something else. Right? Which the city of the indigenous people. Yeah. I stood there for a minute and I thought, oh my God, somebody came and tried to bury the life and the civilization of others. And how did these people live that moment of other people coming and taking over their, their land? their resources, 
erasing their languages, their culture, replacing them, and ruling them. That's how I feel. Yeah. And I, I have to say, I never, I had never connected the history of indigenous people in Latin America. And then I realized, oh my God, North America as well, right? This was yeah. like 20 years ago that happened to me. Maybe 20, yeah, 20 something years ago. Um, and as I traveled through Latin America and saw the indigenous people and, and, and their stories, I felt the whole deep connection of the central settler colonial system were living exactly the same thing. When I went to New Zealand and saw the Maoris, I was like, wow. Yeah. I get it. You know, I was like, I get it. I get you guys, you know? And and when I speak, they get me. They know we we share all of that. And the Maoris, I saw the Aborigines in Australia, and that's a completely different story, right? The 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 Maoris have managed to take back actually they I mean it's that's a very complex story, but yeah, they took back, but they also they were very fierce from the beginning not to accept that they would be erased completely. So yeah, I I see I see through all of that. So I invite people to read even Las Venas Abiertas de America Latina of uh, by uh, by uh, the the Uruguayan uh, writer um, Galeano Eduardo Galeano. Mm. You know. That's the kind of stuff that helps me understand Palestine. Yeah, Indigene indigeneity. Yes, settler colonialism and how we are divided into those two worlds. The cathedral and the world buried underneath. Yeah, you know, it's so funny. Even that lexicon, that that vernacular, that th that vocabulary, excuse me, that vocabulary is now becoming part of people's vernacular. I know, I love it because when I said it, people would look at me and say, you know, it's like Nekba. We would say yeah. Nekba and people are like, what's that? Like it was a land without people. Yeah, a land so, without people. No, they didn't kick anybody out. No, they kicked us out. They kicked my father out. They kicked my grandmother out, my grandfather, all my aunties and uncles, and we were never allowed to go back. Yeah. Can I ask you one last question? Right. Um, you you just you keep on talking, and I keep on having other questions for you. So, if you'll allow me, I'll ask you another question. How do you do? You know, usually when we ask questions about, you know, what should people read, they mention some of the the same names that you mentioned, and other. There's a long list of names, obviously. No one ever mentions like the opposition research, right? Mm. No one's. No one ever says, you know what. You want to try to understand yeah. the situation? You should read a bunch of Zionists, understand their yeah. rhetorical right. arguments. You're right. And it's it's a problem because every now and then I speak to somebody and they'll be like, oh my God, I, I saw this person speak mm. and I couldn't believe what they were saying. I, like I, th They sound crazy to me. And I'm like, yes, they sound crazy to you, but they don't sound crazy to millions of people. And they don't sound crazy to the, the millions of people that they don't sound crazy to clearly have the keys to the car. So mm -hmm. in order to dismantle these arguments, not to convince that writer, you're mm -hmm. never going to convince that writer. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, Barack Obama. I heard him once talk about debating John McCain on stage. And he was saying, I knew from very early on, I understood that I wasn't debating him. I was debating the people at home and I wanted to win the people at home. I didn't care if I would beat him. Right. And so, but he needed to understand his, his perspective. So I'm, I'm always curious how much internally in the newsroom are you guys, how much time are you spending understanding their arguments so as to deconstruct them for the sole purpose 
of meeting the people at home and say, you've probably heard this. You've probably heard this argument. We heard it too. This is why it doesn't make sense. Mm. Yeah, we do this. I mean, you asked me about my personal readings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My identity, my understanding of Palestine. And I have, <laughs> yeah. to, I have to say, I did read the other narrative on Latin America, for example, because that's mm. not kind of like that's easier for me. I did read the Spanish and even the American narrative on Latin America and how it was oh discovered and incredible that like people still repeat that. Yeah. Um so I managed to I, I, I did that homework on Latin America because it is not an emotional I'm not a direct victim of that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think on Palestine, uh, I get upset. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 the, the the trauma is just very big. But in our work here in the newsroom, we have first of all, we do have people who are real um, connoisseur of the this matter. We have Jewish people working with us as well, who have studied and who study and who know very well. So. Yes, we do have those conversations. Hundred yeah. percent, absolutely, yes. And I, I, again, the psychological barrier makes it difficult for me to read. Although I have written, I have read Jewish literature, right? Not Zionist political. Yeah, of course, Jewish Jewish literature Jewish for literature, sure. And I find it incredibly insightful. I find that it there are I I find so much more in common uh, definitely than, uh, than I would expect right uh, yeah and and I do think that the commonalities between uh, our culture and Jewish culture are huge you know yeah huge so but yes we do that in 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 the newsroom definitely yeah you know it's so funny that you say that because one of the things that I hope comes out of this, there's, and they are, they're, they're cousins of each other. The, one thing is a dislocation from anti-Semitism to anti-Zionism, right? And that's happening in the States. I, I see people, yes. you know, white American friends of mine understanding, oh, wait a second, I'm, a, I clearly can not only can be anti-Zionist, I should be anti-Zionist if I just follow my my ethics. If I just go down the checklist, oh, clearly I'm anti-apartheid. O- obviously, I should not be supporting an a- apartheid state. Okay, clearly, right? And so that's happening in the in the West. I can see that dislocation happening. But a similar dislocation, I think, needs to happen in the Arab world, which is to say, people saying, wait a second, I will not stand for any shred of anti-Semitism around me, not an, not a, not a whiff of it, because for one reason, one obviously there's the human the human rights reason, but not only the human rights reason. Jews were a, such a huge integral part of the Arab world for uh, <laughs> centuries and centuries and centuries. We should be reclaiming it with pride. We should be saying, of course, the Jewish story is part of the Palestinian story. Hundred percent. My be... community had Jewish neighbors. In, of course, she did. In Tabareya, in Tiberias, of course, and they were playing together. Muslim, Christian, Jews were all. Of course, people, she did. You know, people should be pushing back on this idea of yes. Jews and Arabs. We still use this dichotomy: Jews and Arabs. That's this so wrong a... because Jews can be Arabs, Arabs can be Jews, exactly. Christians can be Arabs, and Christians can be. You know, I mean, it's it's all. Yeah. It's the black and white situation we are so. led to be to be placed in. And let me tell you something here on the on the anti Semitism thing. I yeah. mean, why do we keep being asked about it and, and pushed into the corner on and we didn't do this. It's the Europeans who did it. We were yeah. never racist against the Jews. It was not us. On the contrary, when they were refugees, they came to Palestine, we received them. They were running away from the Europeans who are now punishing us 
accusing us of being anti-Semitic when they are the anti-Semitic people. You know, they're the ones who did this whole mess. We yeah. received the Jews when they came in boats. We said, oh my God, you know, yes, of course. And hey, yeah, this, this whole thing of, what I see now is something called anti-Palestinianism. Mm. It's the apartheid I told you about that I feel that everybody's practicing on Palestinians. There is this anti-Palestinian sentiment that is being, you know, when, when you see people mixing um, Palestine with all kinds of other words and just deciding that anything Palestinian is bad, like branding the war as Israel Hamas, and then considering that anything that Israel targets is, is legitimate. It's killable. Yeah. And this is anti-Palestinianism. That's how I see it. Yeah. So, but do we have some work to do on our side? Yes. And at AJ Plus, we try, especially in AJ Plus Arabic, Arabic version, yeah. to show our audience how many Jews are out there on the street putting their lives in danger, going to the Congress, taking over entire tube stations, in the UK, in New York, saying, no, not in my name. We do try to, we just did interviews with Mexican Jews, Argentinian Jews, who are totally anti-occupation, totally anti-Zionist. And I, I think this is, it's a very important time to do this. This is a time for us to see each other. I think people need to start thinking this is not about where you come from. This is not about your religion. This is not about the color of your skin. It is about your values. Do you believe that we all deserve the same right, simple right? Live freely, move freely, choose your path, marry who you want, love how you like, learn what you want, travel, Think, speak up, simple things. Get bread in the morning if you want bread. Have water, clean, shelter, you know? I mean, simple things. If you believe that, then we're good. It doesn't matter where you come from, what yeah. language you speak, where you were brought up. It's a very simple thing, Mikey, isn't it? My kid. Uh, Dima. Uh, thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, and I, I, I was telling you before we started this call, um, the, the work that I'm doing is taking a, a toll on me and I cannot imagine what sort of toll this is taking on you. Um, so I hope that you're trying to take care of yourself, um, because we need you. So... Thank you. And I, I can maybe, from my experience of covering so many wars now, say one thing that I've learned. Um, in these times, more than anything, you need to take care of yourself. Because they don't have a choice in Gaza. They cannot, they don't have the luxury of taking care of themselves, right? We need to be strong. We need to be well. We need to drink water, eat chocolate, rest, sleep, take some time off, spend half an hour, 15 minutes doing whatever so we can stay sane, strong, and healthy and keep telling their stories because they need us more than ever. We cannot collapse. We cannot be not be okay. I, I think that uh, it's very, very important that we every day take care of ourselves and talk to the people we love, support them, get support, ask for help when we need to, and find that rhythm. Turn off when you need to turn off. It is very important. I, I know that when I was covering Iraq, I was not taking care of myself and I collapsed. I was crying every day in the restrooms of Al Jazeera. I was, I couldn't bear it. I was struggling to continue working at that rhythm. Um, 
yeah, I hope that people drink water, go to the bathroom, shower, wash your hair. Uh, you know, like these things matter. Shimawa. Shimawa. Yeah. Where, you know, take care of yourself. If you're yeah. well and happy, then you can do a better job telling the story of those people. They need yeah. you strong. So I invite everybody to do that, especially journalists in newsrooms. And I invite people who manage newsrooms to take care of their people by showing them that they're doing that. They're taking care of themselves. Yeah. So thank you so much, Mikey, for this uh, for yeah. space. And um, I hope we get to talk about. Yeah, there will be a, a part two, I'm sure. But um, yeah. So um, this has been a special episode. We still have uh, a couple more on the series. If you haven't gone back and listened to the other ones, there have been some really, really powerful conversations as well. Um, Dima, thanks again. Salam.